I'm here. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I'm here from the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm going to let my other um, co-presenters uh, introduce themselves, and then I'll share the screen uh, with, uh, with our presentation. Hi, everybody. My name is Christopher Loomis, and I'm faculty representative from California College of the Arts in San Francisco and Oakland, California. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Maselli, and I am the Director of Graduate and International Admissions at the College for Creative Studies, otherwise known as CCS, in Detroit, Michigan. Hello, everyone. My name is Anita Bardwaj, and I'm representing the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, located in downtown Chicago, and I'm on the International Admissions team. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here, uh, but just give me one moment. Okay, can everybody see the presentation? I'm just going to put it on full screen. And it is not letting me do this. Um, <laughs> can everybody see it okay or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I am not, I don't have the full screen option all of a sudden. Um, can we just go ahead and do the presentation as is, or should I go ahead and do it in a different format? Can I do it like this? What do, what do we all think? That's, that's I'm fine. Sure. Okay. I'm really sorry. Um, this Okay, so let's just get started then, apologies. So um, all of my colleagues are here. We just introduced ourselves. At the end, we're gonna go ahead and leave our contact information for all of you to get uh, in touch with us at your leisure. But for now, um, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of, um, of our presentation and then we'll get into it. So we are here uh, four different colleges of art and design from the United States. Um, and we are all part of the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design, otherwise known as ACAD. Um, and the reason why we're telling you about ACAD today um, is because um, it is uh, a membership organization. As you can see on the slide, there are 36 colleges of art and design in the US and Canada that are a part of this consortium. Um, and the reason why um, this is a critical institution is because it provides a lot of resources for you as students uh, interested in arts and design. So it's a great place for you to access information about all of our colleges. You can kind of do a comparative analysis on the things that we offer, the different majors, uh, pre-college programs, etc. But then the other great thing uh, that it uh, provides is um, option, opportunities for portfolio reviews from um, all of our schools. So every year you can submit five images of your work for free reviews from all of the counselors from the different schools that are part of the ACAD um, association. It's free. It's something that you can take advantage of and as a way to also get in touch and start having these conversations about um, how to prepare your portfolio, how to think about applying to colleges of art and design, um, and what it means for your future as an artist or a designer. The other thing um, that is also offered through ACAD that we like to talk about is uh, virtual national portfolio days, which is, um, it's kind of a, a, a similar thing, but a little bit different version. If you sign up for a national portfolio day, all of us counselors are available you know, for one-on-one -on -one conversations that you then share your work with us individually and we can talk about your work, how to strengthen your portfolios, et cetera. So they're just great opportunities for you to take advantage of as students uh, thinking about art uh, and design as a professional career choice. So that being said, we're going to get into just a short um, individual presentation. All four of us are going to just give a three to five minute presentation of our schools, and then we're going to talk about ideation and leave room for our questions and answers at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Chris at CCA. All right. Hello again, everybody. I'm going to tell you about California College of the Arts. So CCA was founded in 1907 in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we are a two campus college. San Francisco is our main campus and home to our first year program and student housing. 
First and second year students live on campus in our newly constructed Founders Hall and have access to full-scale community and dining options within a flourishing art-making hub. And then Oakland is our historic campus where students have access to facilities and creative opportunities uh, such as um, um, our archives, libraries, and a few majors are in Oakland. But students have access to both um, campuses um, and communities. Uh, the college's creative culture is built around the ideals of interdisciplinary collaboration, sustainability, community engagement, and social equity. Offering 22 undergraduate programs, including a new major in game arts, CCA educates students to shape culture and society through the practice and critical study of art, architecture, design, and writing. You can also see the STEM designated programs listed here with an asterisk. These programs give students an additional two years on their student visas for OPT training. CCA's emphasis on connecting art and culture is mirrored in our curriculum, including our critical ethnic studies classes. CCA is the only art and design school in the world that requires students of all majors to take critical ethnic studies classes. These courses are dedicated to social justice and equity from local, national, and international perspectives. Being in San Francisco gives students chances to engage with a vibrant, creative community. San Francisco is home to hundreds of art galleries, many world-class museums like the SF MoMA and Silicon Valley tech companies. 85% of CCA students intern with Bay Area-based companies like Adobe, Levi's, IDEO, and Google and many go on to work at these same Bay Area companies. In fact, CCA is rated number one for return on investment by pay scale. We have small class sizes with an eight to one student to faculty ratio, allowing students to build up a mentorship relationship with their faculty. And lastly, CCA believes in having an interdisciplinary curriculum. This means that students are encouraged to take classes across disciplines, meaning that you're not confined to one perspective or one way of making. Example, as a graphic design major, you can also take classes in animation or furniture or sculpture. CCA has over 80 shops, studios, and lab spaces that support all departments, programs, and students. Thanks. Hello, everyone. The College for Creative Studies or otherwise known as CCS, is a four-year nonprofit um, college that offers both bachelor's and master's degrees. CCS was founded over a hundred years ago during the arts and crafts movement, and we are about we have about one thousand four hundred students with a nine-to-one student-to-faculty ratio. We have been named a best value school by PayScale and Money Magazine. CCS is proud to be located in Detroit, Michigan which is in the Midwest of the United States. Detroit has a rich history of art and innovation, along with having a, the number one concentration of design occupations. Detroit was named the first and currently only city, UNESCO City of Design in the United States. Cities with this designation are all committed to using design as a tool for economic development. This is something you will experience throughout your curriculum. There are many exciting things happening in Detroit, like Apple recently choosing to open a developer academy, which is the first of its kind. CCS has direct entry programs, which means you will apply to the department of your choice with major specific courses starting that first semester. This is different from schools who may have a full foundation year before a major is declared. In the center, you will see a listing of our undergraduate programs. Our craft and material studies program is quite robust due to our history, but some of our more popular majors are animation, game design, and illustration. We also have a unique program such as concept design, where students create elements used in film and animation, such as spaceship, weapons, and characters. Although we are founded as a craft school, to this day, we are internationally known for our product design and transport desi transportation design programs. Michigan has a number one concentration of commercial and industrial designers, along with three major automotive brands. This allows us to have direct connect 
connection with those industries and oftentimes our faculty are still in the fields. Seven of these undergraduate programs hold STEM designation, which can lead to a two year extension of your OPT, totaling three years of potential work on your student visa. Those programs are communication design, product design, transportation design, and all sections of the entertainment arts. CCS also offers a career development office that provides a number of opportunities to connect with industry professionals throughout through internships, industry days, portfolio reviews, and corporate sponsored projects. These projects are classroom skills in a real world situation to prepare for direct entry into industry. An example of this would be our recent sponsorship with Vectiform and Epic Games, who had undergraduate game design students and graduate transportation design students exploring future concepts for interaction within vehicle interiors, as well as surrounding connected environments. Offering, offerings like these lead CCS students to a 96% employment rate within a year of graduation. Thank you. Okay, now we are off to Micah. I'm just going to try one more time. Enter full screen. Is this? Ah, it's the same thing. We still have that. <laughs> we still have that little sidebar. Anyway, um, so just to tell you all a little bit about Micah today, um, we were founded in 1826. We are the oldest college, uh, continuously degree granting college of art and design in the United States, and we're constantly ranked among the top 10 colleges of art and design in the nation. Uh, we have roughly 3,500 students across our undergraduate, graduate, and open studies programs with uh, students coming from 52 different countries. 30% uh, of, our, of our undergraduate student body uh, population is international. We are located in the city of Baltimore uh, in the heart of the East Coast Corridor. Uh, Baltimore is actually an important historic port city, which is now home to the clothing giant uh, Under Armour, and it's also the second largest center of the video gaming industry in the US. We're very close to other major urban hubs like Philadelphia, New York City, and uh, Washington, D.C. Um, so as a student at MICA, you have lots of access to culture and um, internship opportunities, and of course, as a professional, um, as uh, job, interview, uh, job uh, opportunities as well. Our campus is uh, composed of about 30 buildings, all in about a walkable five block distance in the heart of Baltimore City. Each major has either an entire floor or sometimes even an entire building devoted to it, depending on how um, comprehensive it is or how, um, how popular it is. Um, we also have uh, three uh, uh, spacious apartment style residence halls where students are going to live on campus for your first two years as a student at MICA, and then you have the opportunity to move off campus if you so choose for your second two years. At MICA, we're developing a new generation of artists and designers, ones that possess both creative and critical thought processes. And so our education has four core tenets to it. This is how we do it, that our education is in, uh, uniquely integrative, customizable, entrepreneurial, and purpose-driven. We have 26 undergraduate majors, which you declare at the end of your first year, because we do have a foundation year program that we call the first year experience. We also have 21 minors, opportunities for study abroad or real life projects, as well as 20 graduate programs um, for you to continue your education. Our majors span from the traditional to the cutting edge uh, with things like graphic design, sculpture, illustration, painting, product design, to things like ecosystem sustainability and justice. It's also important to note that MICA's uh, graphic design and animation majors are both STEM designated programs. So they allow students to extend their OPT period uh, for up to three years post-graduation. Mike, as a MICA student, you can also take advantage of a really unique program uh, that we have developed with 13 other universities in the Baltimore area called the Baltimore Student Exchange Program, which includes neighboring institutions like Johns Hopkins University or the Peabody Institute, where students, uh, as a starting your sophomore year, you can take one class every semester at these other institutions for no additional fees. 
Mike is a leading contributor to the global creative economy, and we have alumni who are working at internationally recognized institutions like Apple, Google, Nike, Adobe, Disney, the United Nations. We are consistently a top producer of Fulbright, uh, alum of Fulbright scholars, and our alumni are also frequently featured on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. A recent survey uh, of our graduating class revealed that just nine months after graduating, 95% of our students were either enrolled uh, in a creative industry, or I'm sorry, enrolled in a graduate program or uh, were working in a creative industry, which is a testament to how well we prepare you to be successful um, in your careers as Michael alumni. And finally, to support the entrepreneurial focus of our students and alumni, uh, professionalization is, developed, is uh, built into every major. 70% of our students complete at least one internship during their time at MICA. We also have uh, a newly developed minor called Creative Entrepreneurship, which, which can be attached to any major, really preparing you uh, for a successful uh, independent career in arts and design. Um, and now, finally, uh, we, of course, recognize the need for financial support. And so we do offer generous four-year scholarship packages for our international students that are both competitive, competitive and merit-based. Um, so that's all I have for Micah. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Anita. Hi, everyone. Uh, Anita here from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, located in beautiful downtown Chicago. We are definitely an urban campus located in what's called Chicago's Loop, flanked by Lake Michigan. Um, so SAIC was founded in 1866 and is one of the most historically significant nonprofit independent schools of art and design in the U.S., offering both undergraduate and graduate degrees. We are currently ranked in the top five for our art and design schools in the U.S. for our undergraduate programs and second for our graduate programs in fine arts by U.S. News and World Reports. Very proud of that. Um, and recently number seven out of 220 U.S. and international colleges by QS World University Rankings. Um, a couple more rankings for SAIC. We're also ranked in the top five for our programs in fiber arts painting and drawing, photography, printmaking, sculpture, and time-based media. So that includes film and new media. Um, we also are a producer of Fulbright Scholars. Uh, we recently had five alums that were named Guggenheim Fellows, which is a very prestigious award. Our population consists of over a 1,200 international students uh, representing about 33% of our student population and they're coming from 67 different countries all over the world. We have an 8 to 1 student faculty ratio so fairly intimate. A couple things to note about SAIC that makes us unique. Uh, we are a true museum campus so one of the most incredible resources that you have as a student at SAIC is the Art Institute of Chicago. It's a museum that holds the third largest collection of art in the entire world right behind the Louvre and the Met and is consistently ranked as one of the top uh, best museums. The museum was actually founded by SAAC faculty as an educational tool and still remains one of our greatest teaching resources. So the museum is the true extension of your studio or classroom. So you as a student, whether you're in your studio class, an art history class, a social science class, a design class, you'll be spending part of that time within the museum making use of all of, uh, obviously, all the beautiful artworks, but also the libraries and special collections that are a part of the museum, some of which uh, students are, are the only ones that have access to. So pretty incredible as an extension of your classroom or studio. Another thing to note about SAIC is that we are truly interdisciplinary. So what that means is that we have no majors, no grades. So there are no majors within the fine arts stream. We do have uh, design pathways in architecture, interior architecture, fashion, visual communication design, which is also graphic design, and designed objects. So that's industrial de design. So if you're interested in furniture, product design, making of things and objects, uh, designed objects is a pathway for you. But still within those pathways, you are um, you can take courses across those 18 different departments. So SAIC is interdisciplinary because the art world is interdisciplinary. So students are, are curating their own curriculum, cur curating their own pathway uh, in courses and studio applications where they see fit. 
Another thing to note about SAIC is that we have one of the oldest and most robust internship programs. So as an SAIC student, you'll enjoy anywhere from one to four internships across your course of study. They are virtual, in person, global, not just within the city of Chicago, but located all over the world. So students have an opportunity to get that real world experience. Um, another thing to note about SAC is that we have partnerships with the likes of Crate and Barrel, Bosch, Samsung, CB2. These are companies that come into the classroom and into the studio that ideate with our students and, and give them world uh, first world experience. And then lastly, our beloved faculty. Our faculty are world renowned artists and makers. Uh, they are featured in biennials, they exhibit regularly, they have thriving practices, and that this allows them to bring that real world experience into the classroom to help our SAIC students become 21st century artists. So that's SAIC in a nutshell. Thank you, Anita. I thought I could do this without the film strip, but I can't. <laughs> so I've got to go back to it. Um, so now the, the core of our presentation, we're going to start uh, talking about ideation and some uh, creative careers. So uh, to get us started, we're going to go back to Anita. Great. So um, thank you all again for being a part of this. Um, at the core of any creative practice is ideation, coming up with ideas. And sometimes that can be very daunting. But ideation is really simple. It is, it's you generating or developing ideas into something that's visual and concrete, and then iterating those ideas and then actualizing them into some sort of a final piece. So simply put, ideation is that creative process of generating, developing, and communicating your ideas, where an idea is really the core of your concept. So it's your ideas and your work. So a couple things to note um, before we get into the ideation process. You know, we're challenging you today to examine time and the value of time. So many, many times, oftentimes, there are, uh, the, the amount of time that it takes to produce the work and the actual work itself are not equal. So sometimes it takes a lot of time up front to create something that's very simple. And sometimes it takes just a few ideas to create something very complicated. So this is an example of an artist, Felix Gon Gonzalez Torres, that has created a work that just consists of two objects. But the idea here is very complicated because he's talking about the passage of time and how time becomes out of sync over a long period of time. So he goes into further explanation how this is a, a metaphor for life as, as uh, his partner was diagnosed with AIDS and so he's just kind of symbolizing the complexities of life in two simple objects. So next we have uh, this concept of when less is more and when more is less. So sometimes when you're coming up with an idea, the execution can be very, very simple, like this photograph in the left. So this, the concept may be somewhat complicated, but the execution is just very simple. One quick photo, one quick gesture. You kind of get the idea of what the piece is talking about in one simple piece. And then on the right you have when more is more. So this is a very complicated piece about structure and you can tell that just by visually looking at this piece on the right that the, the maker has spent a great deal of time kind of um, hands-on into this experience. So two ways of thinking it. Sometimes one simple object is all you need and sometimes the execution is extremely complicated. Thanks, Anita. Okay, so so yeah, so Anita has given us some really great foundations and ways to think about value, right? But so then what do we do with this? When we have an idea, how do we how do we start? So there's kind of two basic ways or three. There's, you can, you can start with your ideas, you can start with the material, or sometimes it's a mix of both. So let me maybe make that a little bit less confusing, I hope. <laughs> so what if you start with materials, right? You have a certain material that maybe you have a lot of, or a certain material that you really, really like. 
So it's important to think about what the material is, right? So every material has its own unique qualities um, and it's gonna have its own unique visual vocabulary. So listen to it, look at it, explore the material. Is it human made like plastic, like something that we see in this picture? Or is it natural, naturally occurring in the world? Is it something like wood or, or wax or, or hair even, something like this? Um, what are the, the physical qualities of it? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it transparent? Does it change states with heat or with cold? Is it flammable? Um, what does the material like to do? You know, if you put pressure on it, does it crackle? Does it, does it break or does it bend with pressure? Does it expand? Uh, does it decompose over time? Does it rust over time? You know, what are the different, uh, forces that change the material? Um, so some artists prioritize this kind of responsiveness to materials in their practice um, and, and just kind of get out of the way and let the materials lead. And so, for example, we have here on this image um, a work by Tara Donovan. Um, and so it's kind of hard to tell from these images because they're, they're such a transformative experience when you see them in person. But it's important to know that this piece is only made of plastic cups, things that are you know, unfortunately, we find everywhere around us, um, and we know which cause create a great environmental impact. But you know, just by simply stacking them and putting them in this abstracted environment of a gallery or you know an art setting, they become this field, this expansive field, and they really transform from their material materiality into this beautiful new conceptual possibility or this conceptual reality. So the, um, in addition to that, it, uh, again, it's important to think about the material that you're choosing. Um, so you're listening to it, exploring the, the potential of it, the things that the material likes to do that it doesn't like to do. But it also has a conceptual voice too. So what does that mean? Um, it means that uh, materials are meaningful in different environments, right? Some will last forever, some will decompose. So this can talk to the to ideas of fragility or ideas of time. Um, sometimes a material is very cheap or it's very expensive. You know, what, what is the difference when something is handmade and, and unique versus something that's mass produced? Um, so how does the value or how does the price affect the value? How does the material affect the value of, of the, the material and then also ultimately the artwork. Uh, materials can also have cultural, socioeconomic, sociopolitical meanings, uh, which can greatly shape the, the meaning of the work at hand. So on this slide, we have the example of El Anetsuai, who, who makes these really, really large scale, um, kind of like fabric, like blanket, like um, sculptures. Um, like I, we don't have the scale here, but this is also much larger than human scale. And he's using um, metal tabs or like bottle caps from from soda bottles from alcohol bottles that were just thrown away they were discarded and they and then he turns them into these beautiful um, abstract objects that completely transform the meaning of these materials. So we go from material to conceptually focused. Now this piece uh, by Kara Walker is called a subtlety marvelous sugar baby. So. Kara Walker here is exploring a mix of material exploration and conceptual focus. So this piece is located in the sprawling industrial site um, of the Brooklyn, uh, of, a, of an old factory in Brooklyn. It's the old Domino Sugar Factory. Uh, so the image of this sphinx, the sphinx um, is also an ancient image, but she is using this kind of figure in a, an updated kind of more modern language. She's using mammy imagery, which is extremely racist. And so she's using these elements, these, these physical elements of sugar, because the sculpture itself is made of sugar. Um, and it's turned into this form uh, that references the slave trade and racist imagery. And it's physically installed in a building that was housed to bring sugar into the United States from various ports around the world. So she is extending the materiality and using it to tell a conceptually rich story through the artwork. 
Then finally here again, I'll just talk about some other conceptually focused works. The one on the left is by artist Mona Hatoum. Um, and it's a documentation of a performance where she tied her Doc Martin boots to her ankles and she's dragging them through the streets um, um, uh, of Brixton. And so uh, these boots were actually really famously worn by both police, British police and skinheads. So she's talking about this kind of political rift and how this object embodies both of these different classes of people. And so she's talking about a very specific moment in 1980s London. And she's using this gesture to talk about this politically um, uh, difficult and, 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 and complex time. And then finally, on the right hand side, we have a piece by Cornelia Parker, where she has actually taken exploded pieces of a shed and re put them together so that we kind of have the feeling of this, this piece that it's in this dynamic moment of explosion constantly because she's put a light at the center of these materials. So we have this really strong sense of movement. Um, yeah, and so moving on from there, I'm going to pass this over to is it Hello. Chris or Anthony. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk briefly about um, what influences ideas. So as you can see on this slide, we talk a little bit about identity, social is issues, culture, objects, functionality, environment, and physical space, stories and narratives, and problem solving. So I'll kind of highlight a number of those um, items and show you a little bit of the work that kind of portrays that. So on the next slide, we'll talk about expressing identity. So on the left side, you'll see that uh, Simba's work aims for the universal. So his work often deals with cultural dialogue between Africa and the West. Here, he's holding a paintbrush clenched between his teeth, unfurling his self-portrait in a spiral before the immensity of the sky, proclaiming a message of planet-wide fraternity. On the right, you'll see in filtered memories, six inches, the artist filters and selects moments in her childhood and teenage years that had a certain impact on her life. These memories refer to the loss of innocence, home, security, and loved ones. The titles and time frame of the drawings are the are important significance. Experiences and memories are frozen in time, giving a glimpse into the artist's personal experience, both in her in her homeland and in Europe. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about reimagining space. So on the left, the key in the hand uh, creator stretched dense zigzagging geometries of red thread that hold rust keys above worn out boats. This installation speaks of the contemporary migrations of and crossing a sea of emotion to reach out to an unknown destination. She incorporated everyday objects, each containing their whole, their own histories because they carried a trace of human life, one felt the existence of these travelers and the other, their bodies weren't there physically. Though the energies of dreams and memories, through the energies of dreams and memories, there's a presence of absence. And then on the next slide, we'll see creating new worlds through storytelling. Telling stories can help us inspire opportunities, ideas, and solutions. Stories are framed around real people and their lives. Stories are important because their accounts are of specific events, not general statements. These provide us with the concrete details that help us imagine solutions to particular problems. So on the left, you'll see that in the summer on a solitary beach, the assemblage began with a wash of color on thin fabric followed by subsequent layers of varying media, media including Indian ink, silk screen, lacquer, pencil, oil, acrylic, and found objects. The combinations dissolve the constraints of time, gene, and of similar card cardinal forces. A tan form arm, forearm thrusts the perfect spiral of vanilla ice cream cone rendered in photorealistic acrylic on a wilted silk screen of a Renaissance era 
era landscape. On the right, Tomas Sanchez's paint, paintings are based on scenery of Cuba and South America. The highly considered compositions and flawless rendering surfaces are heavenly and dreamlike. The paradise is so immaculate that it feels unattainable, a tense and perfect world you see but cannot have. And then on the, the next slide, we'll talk about problem solving and design thinking. On the left is a 3D fabric flow row both as wall covering and clothing design. Here the design is by Iris Van Herpen. And then we received this reproduction by a, um, based on permission from the artists themselves. The collection expired the, in, explored the possibilities of terraforming, which consists of recreating biospheres in another planet that conveys the idea to infinity. And then we'll move on to the next slide. I think we're a slide ahead. Oh. I yeah, Anthony, I think there might have been a, a little different slide there. I think we moved on to so mm -hmm. we. That's correct. Chris, we're ready for you. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right, so, um, so we're gonna talk about the infinite loop of creativity here. So um, contrary to some romantic ideas about art, everything comes from somewhere. Great works come from a process of refashioning things that already exist and recombining things in new ways, rather than creating something out of nothing. The storage portion might be your sketchbook, material collection archive, or any other hiding device, or holding device you can come back to later for ideas. So looking at this diagram, every new experience you have is a raw input. And then from that, it becomes processed. You break it, bend it, mash it up. And then there you have an output. You've made a thing. But what happens beautifully is it creates this feedback loop from your output and then gets mixed in with the new inputs. So this is actually a diagram of how a computer works. Not surprising since humans created computers in their own image. So as a creative, you're constantly having to avoid doing the same things the same way or choosing the path of least resistance to make work you already know you can create well. So how do you do that? So the easiest thing we already know how to do has worked for us in the past. And how to avoid this? We're going to go to the next slide. And Try new things, experiment, push yourself to get out of your habits and comfort zones. That's where you'll make progress in your art. Not every piece you make will be for your portfolio and that's okay. So be vulnerable, learn a new skill, be willing to be wrong, sit with your frustration, embrace confusion, seek embarrassment, be a beginner. So all these things can help us get out of our habit of the path of least resistance. All right. So, so far we've talked about sort of all the sort of process and, and getting things together and, and using all the things to get our ideas going. Now, how do we put our ideas into action to where, to where we're actually producing, producing things for the world? So, what the first step one of the first steps is beginning to build a language around your work so all the stuff that you've acc accumulated um it's helpful to use this diagram or a, a diagram of such to uh, begin to build a language around your work so um when you do this you can have some of your own artwork 
uh, while you do this or pick an artist that you love. You can hang it on the wall, lay it out on the floor, or put it on a screen. Um, look at your notes. What has someone said about your work? What have you written about it? Um, look at your artist statement. Um, you know, again, what have you written about it? What, what have you written about in the past that you can use here? And then free writing. Um, free writing is a good way to loosen up and, um, and think about your work um, while you, you know, you can type or handwrite for five minutes, for example, without stopping. But this diagram here is a little more formulaic. So start with a topic or material. What's the thing that excites you the most about your work? And for instance, it could be cats. And why? What are the qualities? Um, what really excites you about cats? Well, they're adorable and they have cultural history. And what is the medium or form? How does it take shape? What form would it take? Well, it could be a performance. You could wear a cat suit or two cat suits. You could have a lot of hair. And then what is the context or who is your audience? How does this thing exist or function in the world? So at this point, I am the primary audience and I want to bridge humans and cats and see how closely we are related to animals. So all these things are useful and just starting to jumpstart your ideas once you've amassed all those things. Okay, so step two is research. So step one is creating that language, those descriptors, those words. So you take those words, highlight a few of them, and then you go to research them. So we are going to challenge you to go beyond Google. You know, check out archive.org and ubuweb.com. These are two resources specifically for artists. So you are going to find images, video, uh, content, far beyond what you would be able to find on Google. So this hopefully will stimulate some more creativity, etc. But you highlight those words and then put those words into the search engine and see what comes up. So you repeat this as, as many times as possible until you start to build a catalog or a repository, just like we referred to earlier, of images and content and subject matter around the topic that you're interested in. And then what do you do with all of it? Well, as you'll see, this step is called failure with a slash through it. But what we mean by that is experimentation. So this is about experimentation. So you have your ideas, you have materials, uh, you have questions, you have your research. Now experiment with it. Try as hard as you can to not be afraid to fail. Um, because honestly, honestly, we believe that there really is no failure in this process because failure really is only in inability in, in this case to recognize possibility, right? So don't overthink, just make, be open, be curious, play, explore the materials, learn from every outcome. That's the other part of it, right? If you can learn how to fail well, it means that you learn from what happens from your mistakes, or sometimes you discover something in that process that you would have never found had you not failed, right? Um, and just try not to self-edit because you still have so much time and so many questions to, to, to sort out, right? So just let all of that possibility exist. And then. So next up is archiving and edit the information. You can't use research if it isn't accessible to you. So it's important to organize it. These steps can begin with uh, the process of editing and archiving. So you can see a, a brief listing of archiving and editing. So with archiving, you want to ask yourself a few questions. Can you make room on a wall for the important images? Can you dedicate a single sketchbook or scrapbook for our research materials only? Do you have a space on the computer, external hard drive, or a cloud storage for digital materials? How would, they, how would you label a series of folders for this information in a digital space? And then do you have equipment or budget for color printing and digital images? And then with editing, how much time in your art um, making schedule can you devote to using your research? And what research is most important to you right now? 
Where could it live for easy access? What materials don't you need anymore? And what can be discarded? And finally, step five, repeat as needed. So what we've given you today is kind of an architecture or framework for a very general process. And so the important thing about repeating as needed is it's going to give you the opportunity to, to mold your own process and to, to figure out the parts that really make sense for you and the parts that really feel like a good working process for you and to really create a good um, good working rhythm, a good chance to, to um, gather your information and to, to develop a creative practice that makes sense for you, that feels good for you and, and, produce, and ultimately helps you create the artwork that is meaningful for you. Um, and that's the most important part of this whole thing. So these again are just a general framework and general suggestions for you to then practice, try out, test and create your own version of. Um, so all of that being said, we're going to move on to the final part of this presentation and hopefully leave a couple minutes for questions at the end. So we're going to talk about some opportunities for, for how you stay or how you become and how you stay successful as a, a, an artist or designer in the world today. Okay, Chris again, and I'm going to talk about the art school perspective. And uh, this is actually a great shot of our school. This is um, nice to see. So um, when you think about art school, there's a lot of ideas about what it does. But um, really, there's some basic skills that you learn at art school. Art school teaches you to think. Um, it teaches you to th think critically. Um, such as in critique culture. Art school teaches you creativity. Art school teaches you to be solutions oriented and to work collaboratively and to work iteratively. That is working on the same idea over and over and over. Um, and this is good for our current era. New fields are developing at fast rates. Having transferable and flexible skills is essential. You don't just want technical skills, but also larger metacognitive skills that were, will remain as technical requirements change. So statistically, 88% of art school graduates are satisfied with their current work, and the number of artists in the workforce has increased by 6% over the last decade. And then Creativity, originality, and initiative is the number three in demand scale predicted for 2022. Okay, so all that being said, there are a lot of creative jobs out there. In fact, there's over 600,000 creative jobs uh, in businesses that employ creatives um, around the world. And the number of jobs is projected to grow to over 700,000 jobs for creatives with a median salary of about 57 grand. So that's, that's a lot of money and a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunities. So this is a list of some titles that our current alums have have right now. So you can see they range from animation, artist, brand strategy, editor, drafts person, librarian, teacher, muse museum curator, photographer, writer, web developer. The list goes on and on and on. This is a very short list. The key here is that if you are interested in any one of these fields, to drill down just a little bit deeper. So take architecture, for instance. If you're interested in the architecture field and you research an architecture company, you will find a number of creative jobs within that field. So there are designers that design the outside of buildings, designers that design the inside of buildings, designers that uh, specify this, the color, the palette, the textures, the fiber within it. There are designers that come in and brand the entire experience. There are designers that come in and photograph everything. And there are designers that come in and put everything on the web, right? And then advertise, etc. So you get the idea. You could take any one of these fields and drill down a bit, a bit deeper and find that there's a plethora of, of creative jobs within any given field. Oh. 
the thing that's also really important to remember about what Anita was just saying, um, especially in relation to that last slide is, you know, what that represented is just actually a small fraction of what it's possible to do as an artist or designer today. But well, that's probably a very overwhelming thing to think about and that's okay because you have a lot of time to sort this all out. But what's important to remember now is that when you choose a school, it's important to think about the career services that are available and the career development centers that are available at these schools in order to support you in your journey as an artist or a designer. Um, because that is, these centers are devoted to supporting you in helping you figure out um, how you become, how you go from student to professional, right? And, and how you stay successful at, at it. So some of the important things that these career development centers offer are things like preparing you for, for internship opportunities, preparing you for job interviews. Um, they, they help you locate these opportunities. And then a lot of them, like for a, a lot of our schools, for example, these resources stay with you for your entire life. There's something that you can access not only two, three, five years after you graduate, but for a lifetime. So it's really important to know that you are not gonna be responsible for figuring this all out on your own. There are teams of people whose jobs it is to help you be successful at whatever it is that you want to do in the arts or, or design fields um, as a professional. So what about STEM? You heard us all mention a number of programs that we, we offer at any of our institutions that are STEM designated. But we also want you to think about that out of 7.6 million STEM workers, 4.3 of them million don't have a degree in STEM. 93% of those in STEM fields have some sort of a creative background. Art schools not only foster creativity, but teaches you how to think create critically and be collab collaborative in solutions um, oriented. An IBM poll of 1,500 CEOs indicated that creative thinking is a number one value leadership quality in today's industries. On the next slide, you'll see a brief um, number of images of all the institutions, companies, organizations that our alumni are currently working at. Um, so our alumni can work from anywhere from uh, Meta, so there's Facebook, Mattel, Disney, Puma, um, Ford, Adidas, and they can also work in um, individual galleries and museums. So there are countless opportunities for anybody with an art and design background. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and again, this is just a small sampling of where we all have uh, alumni or, or career, different career opportunities available um, internationally and nationally recognized institutions. So that is the end of our presentation. I'm gonna leave our email addresses up here um, on the screen for a moment. And um, we can also put them in the chat, but we know that not all of you have access to the chat right now. So please take advantage of this. And we do wanna turn it over and make sure we answer any questions that you have for us today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you everyone for being with us. Thank you for the creative ideas, for the, for the great presentation. Um, and for those who will watch our our session later, if they, if you have any questions for the presenters, please forward them to us, and we will be uh, we will forward them to, we will forward your questions to them. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.